Okay. Justin, are you there? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So welcome everybody to this third uh, talk of uh, this cycle of visual integration and human evolution. So the third uh, talks uh, will the peripersonal state. Uh, you know that our brain uh, does interpret uh, in a different way things, action, uh, uh, localized behind the body or within the space of the body. Uh, this means that uh, between our sensation and our perception, there's a, 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 a strange unit, uh, which, which is the body of the person that uh, is interpreting the relationship, the special relationship uh, between things. And uh, in this case, we have uh, here uh, Justine Cléry, uh, she's uh, for France, actually uh, she works uh, a lot in Lyon, but now she is at the McGill University in Canada, and she has a very long trajectory uh, um, in studying the very personal space and uh, in investigating our cognitive response uh, to the very personal space. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Justine, uh, for giving this talk. And uh, please, let's go ahead and with your presentation. And um, I invite everybody to, to, to keep any question for, for the end uh, of, the, of the presentation. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And welcome to this. Uh, cycle of the Italian Institute of Anthropology. Hello everybody, thank you for this kind introduction. So I'm delighted to be here today to present a part of uh, my work on the functional network on the peripersonal space. Our environment is often perceived as a unit, unitary space. However, growing evidence demonstrates that the brain contains a modular and a dynamic representation of space. Neuropsychological studies report a dissociation between the near and the far space processing both in human and in monkey. For example, Rizzolatti and collaborator um, in 1983 have shown that the unilateral ablation of the frontal field produced in the non-human primate an inattention to control lateral object more pronounced for far objects than for near object. In contrast, the unilateral uh, abrasion of the premotor area 6 produced an, an inattention to control lateral object that is more pronounced for near than for far object. So we clearly see already a dissociation between the near and the far depending on the region. So some cortical regions are involved in the personal space, that is a space that is directly surrounding us and which we can directly interact with and also call sometimes near space. While other cortical regions appear to process the extra personal space or far space that process uh, the space that is far away from the subject and that cannot be directly acted upon by the body. Some functional region seems to be involved in peripersonal space, both in monkey and in human. We found some homologous regions such as primordial areas in monkeys and in human, intraparietal areas, and parietal associative areas. However, over the last decades, the definition of the peripersonal space has evolved as it seems that there is no unique peripersonal space per se, but rather multiple peripersonal spaces or subfield. So today we'll first talk about this multiple, multiple peripersonal space and the related functional network, and then I will discuss hypotheses about the evolution of this peripersonal space. So strictly speaking, the margin between oneself and the outside world is defined by the skin. So the skin codes direct contact to the body, whether generated by the outside world, like a kiss from a beloved, a bite from a mosquito, 
or by the body itself. For example, my right hand touching my left cheek. Just beyond this stricto sensu body margin lies the so-called uh, peripersonal space. And this peripersonal space has been associated with the idea of a protective space extending the stricto sensu body margin with a security space. So from a sensory perspective, this peripersonal space serves to signal proximity to the body and is functionally linked to protective behavior. It is constrained based on the combination of sensory cues, like static and dynamic visual cues that define a visual peripersonal space that is con constrained by gaze direction. We have static and dynamic auditory cues that define an auditory peripersonal space constrained by the head position. We have also dynamic and uh, dynamic tactile cues that define an offer under considering tactile peripersonal space. So you can see this in uh, space that is signaled by like passive hair or whisker movement signaling hair displacement within this space. Also heat detector signaling change within the purpose of the space even at a distance from the skin. So these different sensory cues are integrated into functional representative of peripersonal space. From a motor perspective, the peripersonal space serves to organize proximal goal-directing action and is functionally linked to proactive behavior. So we call this the action-based PPS. While this schema clearly defines a peripersonal space around the body, contrasting with a space far away from the body, it also highlights the functional heterogeneity of the peripersonal space and raises the question of how these different peripersonal spaces are weighted and integrated in a unitary, unitary functional peripersonal space, both from a psychological and a physiological perspective. Interestingly, using functional magnetic resonance imaging in macaque monkey, we identify several functional networks related to the peripersonal space. First, we have the coding of the structural sensory body margins that correspond to the skin surrounding our body and that involve many somato sensation. With this network, so we identify a parietal temporal prefrontal network that was being stimulated uh, where the face was stimulated in the, on the animal thanks to uh, air puff, so it's just uh, a light tactile stimulation. And we find the involvement of prefrontal area like 946V, premotor areas like F4, F5, but also area 2, somatosensory cortex 2, and the ventral intraparietal uh, area. Similar areas have been found in a second functional network dedicated for functional body margin and vision. Represented here by visual and tactile convergence maps here. So for this tax, some run was uh, presented with only visual stimuli and other with only tactile stimulus. And uh, we extract the activity in both and look at the convergence map. Visual tactile convergence often result in multisensory integration. So visual information just get combined with the tactile information to signal to the brain more than just tactile stimulation. So this result in both uh, speeded up the neural responses and enhanced detection of low intensity stimuli. And in the context of the peripersonal space, uh, the functional binding between these two sensory modalities result in an anticipated recruitment of the tactile processes by here visual stimuli, but it's also the case with auditory stimuli. And that contribute to the prediction of the consequences of the visual modality on the skin. So this corresponds to the impact prediction network. So you can see the same, we find parietal areas, somatosensory areas, and prefrontal areas. Then we use a naturalistic and ecologically parading to stimulate the near and the far space whether with a small cube or a big cube. So for this, we build a two 3D cube of three and 30 centimeters uh, to have the same apparent size depending on where we are stimulated for the uh, distances. The animal had to fix a central lead and we are stimulated either the small cube in the near space, the small cube in the far space or the big cube in the far space. We observe cortical regions that exclusively code 
for near space and mostly in the parietal, prefrontal and temporal areas. The stimulation of the far spatial large striate and extra striate activation extending towards the parietoccipital cortex, the temporal cortex and the area MTMST. Interestingly, when you use uh, frontal parallel visual current movement like this, you also uh, stimulate uh, the occipit occipital striate and extra striate areas and the temporal cortex, so similar to the far spatial network, that possibly suggest an interaction between stimulation size and physical location within far space. Lastly, the dynamic approach of this small cube, small cube into near space elicits strong activation in both hemispheres. This approach of an object toward near space can be considered as an intrusion into the peripersonal space. Interestingly, the visual dynamic stimulation, which predicts an impact onto the face, activates a network similar to the approach network described here. So all this taken together, the different studies described here show that the encoding of different sensory cues of high relevance to peripersonal space, such as visual, tactile, impact prediction, or near cues, are subserved by a common cortical network with specificity to each function. So while the peripersonal was, uh, space was initially considered as a unitary and homogeneous, recent evidence supports the idea of multiple peripersonal space with specificities associated with which body parts that are encored to. For example, the head PPS, the hand PPS, or the trunk PPS. These peripersonal uh, space interact with each other. So for example, an object coming into the trunk PPS will lead to the enlargement of uh, the trunk PPS uh, that enlarge both the head and the uh, and the hand. However, the reverse is not true. So there is a lot of different um, subtleties like this uh, that were still uh, investigated to better understand them. Um, another thing we, are, we looked at is the posterior parietal cortex, because we know that this part of the cortex has a complex somatotopic representation of the face and body in human and in monkey. The inferior parietal lobule and RI5 show a rostral caudal um, somatotopic organization from mouse, uh, yeah, from mouse to the lower limb. But importantly, in both human and monkey, these cortical regions are responsive both to tactile and visual stimulation and can thus subserve a peripersonal space representation along a somatotopic representation. Uh, a somatotopic organization of the parietal PPS representation with a head, uh, the head uh, peripersonal space essentially encoded by the intraparietal ventral area that we mainly highlight in the previous uh, maps. A hand PPS, the hand is in purple, uh, encoded by the area, the anterior. On, on, anterior intraparietal area that is mainly um, influenced by reaching and grasping, but also a trunk PPS that is mostly um, encoded by area 5 and 7B. So there is more work ongoing on, on this to, to really understand better how these somatotopic marks are linked to the peripersonal space. So in the last year, evidence has accumulated in favor of this multiple possible function of the peripersonal space that are modulated and shaped by diverse sources, such as social interaction, uh, emotion, or action context. So based on the data presented here and the literature, we explore possible functional network contributing to peripersonal uh, dynamic resizing. Uh, so First, the occipital cortex encodes space at a large, so with it any expected homogeneous functional specificity with respect to the body. As one progress towards the parietal, the temporal, and the prefrontal cortices, space representation becomes 
more and more specific. So numerous studies show that tool use, whether involving a physical interaction with our body or not, increase the size of the peripersonal space by incorporating the tool in its representation. As a result, we predict that such a plasticity recruits the affordance network. And this network involves temporal region, defining tool identity, as we well prior to frontal rich cross and grasp region. So the peripersonal space in its relevance to action and goal-directed behavior is expected to recruit the exopital cortex, then the parietal, premotor, and prefrontal areas, as well as the temporal cortex and the basal ganglia for all the motor aspects. Then the prepersonal space is also modulated by the social context, suggesting the involvement of the orbitofrontal cortex, such as area 14 or 25, that are really uh, linked to affective behavior. But also the amygdala, that is known to color the emotion, in addition to this occipital parietofrontal network. We have also the peripersonal space that has been shown to increase with anxiety and threatening stimuli. So we'll just expect a contribution of the limbic cortex and the cingulate cortex. In addition, all still the same, the occipital uh, frontal network. Last, the impact prediction network suggests the existence of an alert network, allowing shorter reaction times and increased sensitivity to avoid impact onto the body. So this network is proposed to involve the temporal the temporal cortex and the amygdala, which helps to identify the looming stimulus and its valence. The motor system is also suggested to play a role in predictive mechanism by anticipating the consequences of an action, the near becoming far or the far becoming near, dynamically as a function of the context. So this alert peripersonal space uh, Interaction is expected to recruit the occipital parietal premotor network, but also like premotor areas, temporal areas, and basal ganglia, in addition to the amygdala. So you can see it's still a complex uh, combination of area, really depending on the context and the function uh, behind. So the space around Earth is not a unitary and static space, but rather consists of dynamic spaces shaped by intrasubject variability with a kind of stimulus, for example, a static or a moving stimulus, the valence, either being negative or positive, and the interaction with the environment, like a social um, interaction or interaction with like an object but also with intersubject variability, like the experience, the age, the mental and physical health. And all of this involves numerous brain areas and circuits. So you can see like if you look at uh, reaction time on different tasks, we will really observe differences between subject, but also within the same subject, depending on the condition. A core network spans the occipital, parietal, and prefrontal promotor cortex with multiple connections with other cortical and subcortical areas that allow all of these different functions. However, the exact nature of this functional interaction and the neural basis remain to be explored. So we have seen that the peripersonal space involves many brain areas, but what do we know about the evolution of this peripersonal space? From an evolutionary perspective, the first function of the peripersonal space is a protective function. So indeed, the first objective to meet by any organis living organism is the survival of the species, or the last term at the principle of fitness maximization. So this comes with the ability to avoid and escape danger, as well as with the ability to protect ourselves. As a result, having a mechanism allowing to predictively monitor 
what may happen in the vicinity of the body is important to detect potential threat or anticipate the optimal behavioral response. Um, in the 70s years, Hedeker made several observations in a zoo in Zurich. Uh, he observed that the animals were not processing space uniformly and described a flight response that is species specific. This flight distance is strongly linked to the environmental constraints and changes. For example, the imposed interaction with human impact uh, have impacted flight distance in numerous species, like animals, like dogs, horses, cows, became tamed and reduced, reduced their specific flight distance as a fear against human decrease. Inversely, some species, like some insular birds, who had short flight distance due to the absence of predator and thus weak fear reaction, disappear after the arrival of humans. So you see that this distance is really important, but will change over time. Another uh, behavior is the response to looming stimuli, the signal signals the impact to the body. It's also an important component for animal survival. And accordingly, looming visual stimuli with a certain aspect, like uh, predators or like uh, harmful tools, trigger defensive behavior such as freezing or fleeing in both natural and laboratory conditions. And this has been uh, shown in multiple and diverse animal species, ranging from rodents to insects, non-human primates, and for sure humans. A second important function of the peripersonal space is the action space and its link with tool use. So in addition to the physiological limitations that can impact the peripersonal space, another component to be considered is the environment and the use we make of it. Object manipulation have been observed in a wide range of species, such as mammal, birds, and non-human primates. For example, here, uh, this is the New Caledonian crow. Um, these birds use a variety of complex tools to reach its goal, such as reaching food inside tree. So you can see, like, uh, he use different shape depending of which tree and which food he want to reach. Um, so this, there is a lot of study on this uh, on this behavior on this bird that makes uh, just uh, in, uh, that is quite sorry, but uh, I yeah. have the sensation that at least uh, here I can't see the slide going going on. Okay. No, it's okay. Oh, what do you? Okay. It's okay or? Oh. Now, now there's a change. Okay. Do you see the bird? Yeah. Now I see the crows. Yeah. Okay. Maybe you have some uh, lag okay. in the connection. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Thanks. No worries. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So with this, this bird show like tool use is not specific to human. So other animal can use tool. But However, human present a unique wide range of complex tool use for many different functions that goes beyond phone search and reaching something far away. And this is really the particularity between uh, like primate and um, other animals. So indeed, primate and uh, particularly humans have developed the ability to manipulate objects, notably thanks to the apparition of the opposal thumb by manual manipulation and the bipedal postures that allow dexterity and a refined crunching essential for the manipulation of complex objects of different size and shape. The discrete uh, evolutionary step of positional chest from regression uh, to full bipedal um, posture around like about 2 million years ago is proposed to have been crucial in the evolution of peripersonal space. By becoming bipedal, the relationship between the posture, the body, and the surrounding space has dram dramatic, ah, sorry, dramatically changed. The torso is much more exposed, as uh, it's not directly protected by the arm anymore, and the head and the neck are more vulnerable too, leading to an increased peripersonal space representation. 
while the biped posture may not first look adequate from a survival point of view, this posture gave us uh, other advantages, but how and when this change occur is still debated. But indeed, this biped posture allows to build tools and throw weapons, carry food, watch the surrounding, or wade in the water. However, we believe that globally, the pre-personal space from this postural change to Homo sapiens did not drastically change over the evolution of the Homo species. So it, it may have changed, but more in a more subtle way. And these postural changes have co-occurring with other gradual changes that have enhanced visual spatial perception and integration. The visual spatial abilities have evolved in convergence with the parietal lobe expansion, leading, for example, the possibility of using projecting tools in Homo sapiens. So you can see like the parietal cortex has been bigger and bigger over the evolution. And as shown in the previous um, functional map, you can see that the parietal um, areas play a really key role in uh, peripersonal space. In addition, the progressive increase of tool use from occasional, habitual, and no obligatory use with more and more sophisticated and artificial tools built and created by human led to an adaptation of this pre-personal space for fitting better tool manipulation and integration to the body scan by projecting tools or even projecting themselves into virtual reality or using artificial equipment or object the pre-personal space has extended its boundary for interacting with a wider surrounding environment last human history is showing a constant cultural and social evolution that are progressively differentiating across population and that is expected to impact the pre-personal space in a more subtle way, yet distinctive ways. Indeed, interaction between people are greatly influenced by culture, habits, and social norms that vary according to the country, region, or even the social class of the individual. A simple example, the way of saying hello can be done without contact, simple handshake, hug, or kiss. The very regular use of this practice according to the various use will accustom individuals to more or less regular intrusion in their personal space. And that will potentially modify uh, his, its representation in long term. And as the pre-personal space is highly linked with body representation, it is also born with social interaction and emotion perception. There were some studies showing, uh, looking at six different populations over the globe, some in the north, like uh, Denmark and Scandinavian country, and some other more than south, showing uh, really this differencing between populations that are more contact a more contact population are not and they really see a difference between um, the size of the personal space um, another example of study uh, about uh, these uh, cultural differences uh, came from Sereno uh, in 2009 they have shown that the perception of touch on the face can be modulated by seeing other people being touched or more particularly by the familiarity and the social proximity of the other person. So in this study, uh, Caucasian and Maghrebian subjects present more enhanced tactile um, perception when they are watching faces from their own ethnic group than when they were watching the other ethnic group being touched. So you can see uh, from Caucasian, it's bigger when they see other Caucasian, and the same for Maghreban, it's bigger when they see other Maghrebian face. But interestingly, they observe a similar behavior in relation to the political group the participant belongs to. So it's not just um, the cultural um, link to the ethnicity, but it's really also about the society and the social interaction and believing. And more recently, 
uh, some studies have also uh, been able to uh, look at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the pluripersonal space. Like, uh, for example, from Sereno's group, I know like there are testing some subjects before the pandemic arrived and after they were able to test these subjects before and after and really see the difference. And um, by wearing a mask and practicing social distancing, we have changed the way we perceive our space, others, and how we socially interact. We don't know yet the long-term effect of this restriction, but some studies looked at how it may impact the pluripersonal space. For example, they observed that the physical distancing had impact on the perception of interpersonal distance that was enlarged during lockdown, but also varied within the incident of the virus. The fact that people could uh, be wearing protective equipment, like the mask, or but also influenced by the region where people live and the other culture. So this depends on uh, how many cases, how the news at the TV was and faces the danger or not. So there is a lot of different um, factors linked to the context. But another uh, big question we have is the long-term effect with the new generation. Because there is some studies that already start to see effect of this pandemic on babies. Like babies has not be uh, stimulated in the same way we have been when we are young. So there was not able to see so many different people and you can see, depending on the baby, already some uh, consequences that they are less uh, shy or don't, don't want to go over people they don't know because they are not used to this interaction. So in the next year, we may have other results about this new cultural and evolution, uh, social evolution due to this pandemic. So to conclude, the pluripersonal space can be defined as a multisensory space serving both defensive and action function. Uh, this space is flexible and dynamic as its boundary can be modulating the bonding of the social, emotional and action context. Based on studies in human and non-human primates, we know that the core functional networks encoding this space involve frontal, parietal and temporal areas. But further studies need to be performed to better understand the neurodevelopment of the and the evolution of this peripersonal space. And to uh, look at this part of this question, uh, we are seeking to study the peripersonal space represented in marmoset. Uh, one of the advantages with the marmoset, it's like, is gaining more and more interest for studying neuroscience, but it can also give us important um, cues about the evolution because it's still a primate, but far compared to the uh, monkey. But one of the advantages with the marmoset is also their lifespan because uh, their lifespan is shorter than macaque. They reach adulthood around two years old. So in like two years, you can study these different mechanisms and see the evolution and see how it may correlate to human. Because in human, it takes much more longer to study the neurodevelopment. So there is some new tools and new species we can study to help us better understand the peripersonal space and its evolution. So I would like to thank um, Julian Benamed and Stefan Manning, like, a PhD and postdoc supervisor who helped me to gather a lot of data over the last year. Thank you for your attention.